cocaine, marijuana, people, gold. No, none of these things are trafficked as much as milk powder and chocolate in China. All right, so the milk powder thing is fairly easy to explain. I'll give you a quick crash course. A couple of years ago, a Chinese dairy decided that it would be a good idea to trick the testing equipment into thinking that their milk powder had a lot of protein in it. Because of course, if you have a high level of protein in your milk powder, you can sell it for more because you know that's part of the whole, you know, you're giving your child proteins and DHA and all this kind of nonsense, you know, and that's part of the whole marketing. Uh, so they came up with this ingenious idea to mix melanin, which is a, an industrial laminate, melanin powder into the, the milk powder, which then, of course, if you run tests on it after that, it shows that it has a very high level of protein. Of course, it's not fit for human consumption and, uh, you know, it, it resulted in some pretty terrible situations where you had a lot of uh, infants developing kidney stones, a whole bunch of children died, and of course, the consumer confidence in locally made milk powder was shattered and it will never recover, ever. I don't think it's possible. And uh, you might wonder, like, what's the big deal with milk powder? Because it seems a bit ridiculous, but China has this insatiable desire and hunger for milk powder. Well, if you have a kid here, you have to give them milk powder. That's just how it is. And everybody agrees on this and everybody does it. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I don't think breastfeeding is very popular in China. I don't often see children breastfeeding in, in public. You never see it. I've seen it three times, maybe in the 12 years I've been here. And this is not to say that the children are not being breastfed at home, don't misunderstand me. But I do think that, you know, the way China treats having children is very different to the West. And uh, statistically, this is absolutely true. The amount of C-sections that happen here are, you know, very high percentage. I, and um, I can attest to this, my wife being a doctor, I've asked her about it. And, uh, you know, everyone that I know that's had a kid around here, it all seems to be C-sections, with your exceptions here and there, of course. So they like to have C-sections, they like to uh, feed them milk powder and all these kind of, you know, things uh, instead of doing it the natural way. And that's just how China, modern China is. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and speculate about that kind of nonsense. Let's get into what's happening. So what's happening at the moment with milk powder is there's this massive desire because there are, of course, just millions of people here, obviously. It's got the biggest population in the world, okay? And they're all having kids. Part of, you know, Chinese culture is you get married and you have a kid. So it doesn't matter who you are, what walk of life, if you get married, you have a kid. So you've got millions and millions and millions and millions of people getting married and having kids and uh, there's no exception, <laughs> almost. So of course you've got all these infants everywhere and this massive demand for milk powder and there's no way that anyone's buying the locally made milk powder. So the only place they can go to get milk powder that they trust is overseas. And it doesn't matter if it's from Australia or if it's from Sweden or if it's from America or wherever, they will trust it because it's coming from, you know, overseas. And of course, there are stringent checks on these goods overseas. But the result is that they are raping the world of their milk powder because there's such a demand here. And the demand very often outstrips supply. And I'm going to get into the, you know, into the thick of it. We'll get to the chocolates later. Let me finish up with the milk powder. We'll get to the chocolates. Um, what's happening is you have multiple channels to which people are getting milk powder, trafficking milk powder into China, I should say. Number one, you've got this thing, it's called Dai Go. Uh, dai Go is kind of like a under the table business, which almost every Chinese person who travels abroad is uh, takes part in this. Uh, like for instance, if I go on holiday with my wife, and this really frustrates me, she will get a shopping list from all of her friends. You know, if we're gonna go to Japan, for instance, she's got like pages of you know requests this person wants uh this kind of makeup this person wants that kind of uh you know i don't know this and that thing you know and it's a huge list and what happens is they'll go buy all these things and come back and sell them at a slight profit so they make money it is like a little under the table business it's like uh, it's trading really uh, but this daigo thing goes goes much bigger. You've got people that their entire profession is Daigo. You've got students, Chinese students 
in Australia or in America or whatever other country and they make millions and this is not even an exaggeration they make millions just going to local like uh, pharmacies buying out all of the milk powder and various other pharmaceutical things you know certain drugs and certain things that you can only get overseas or that people only trust from overseas uh, and they go buy like a whole shelf full of these things and then they just sell them and you know ship them back to China and they make huge profits and this is really like a, an actual job for a lot of people for a lot of students for a lot of bored housewives for a lot of new new Im immigrants to other countries so you've got this die goal thing going on and they've got their channels to get it through without being taxed and, and what have you um, and although admittedly the Chinese government has tried its best to make it as hard as possible to do this these days you know for instance they've instituted I believe a 30% tax on any kind of imported stuff these days you know like makeup etc because before they didn't have a massive import tax so even if they were stopped at customs or whatever it wouldn't be a big deal but they've tried their best uh, it still doesn't stop people so you know you'll even get a situation where for instance um, a person that does this Daigo thing in America will go and approach Chinese students uh, for instance and say hey you're going back for the Chinese New Year here you take X amount of this uh, and the next person you take X amount of this I'll pay you a little bit of money and they just stick it in their hand luggage or in their you know sort of check-in luggage and they take it back so they've got these networks of you know ooh, bad road they've got these networks of basically um, mules that take things uh, back to China to sell them at a profit so this is the die go thing but why go through all that effort when Hong Kong is just over the border and this is really what triggered this video off is I was in Hong Kong the other day and I happened to get a request from my wife to buy some some medicine from the pharmacy there uh, for her cousin it's medicine that you can't buy in mainland China it's some something stupid like an immuno booster or whatever you know may as well go buy from Infowars if you believe in that stuff um, but anyway so I'm in the pharmacy and the queues were just ridiculous I had to stand in these queues and people had massive bags of can you guess what milk powder and Ferro Rocher chocolates I'll get to the chocolates later <laughs> those are the main things of course you know cosmetics and other you know various things that you can't get in China or that you don't you know you can't really count on the quality in China they've got all those things and then what they do is they go outside of the pharmacy with their massive big thing they've all got these uh, you know wheelie bags luggage wheelie bags and then they sit there and you can see them working out on their receipts okay this belongs to this person this is what I'm getting for that person and they're very meticulously organized but they block the passage there it's very annoying because you've got so many of them doing it and they're packing their bags and splitting up the loads and you know trying to figure things out because uh, of course it's become a lot harder to take things over the border from Hong Kong because they've now implemented all sorts of quotas because not that long ago there wasn't really a limit to what you could bring over the border so people would just take the piss and they would literally bring almost like a pallet of milk powder with them over the border each time and it resulted in a lot of angry Hong Kong people because actually all the stock of milk powder this baby formula milk powder was bought out in Hong Kong and there was never enough for the local people so that annoyed people a lot and of course it's a huge nuisance you've got these smugglers um, coming over blocking the roads really annoying everyone with all their, their nonsense you know what I mean so it, it's long story short it's always been a bit of a pain in the ass but so they introduced these uh, quotas so you can only bring a certain amount like I think it's three tins of milk powder over every time or something so of course this doesn't stop the smugglers um, because they'll always find a way and I'll tell you about some of the different ways they do this so you've got these guys there splitting things up like I said and working out all their things then they've got these runners who will then go across the border and go drop it off on the other side and then go back again so China and Hong Kong is complicated right 
Uh, if you haven't figured it out from my videos so far, I'll give you a little bit of a, a quick introduction to the whole situation. Hong Kong is pretty much a different country. It was handed back to China, you know, in 1997. But in all honesty, it is another country. Like if you approached it from an outside perspective, because you have to cross a border, you have to go through customs, you have to get your passport stamped. They use a different currency. They've got a different form of government. They've got, uh, you know, they drive on the other side of the road. Uh, everything about Hong Kong is different to mainland China. Uh, you know, English is one of the official languages there. and it runs on sort of a British law type thing. It's a different country, all right? Except that it's not, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, and of course there's literally no sales tax in Hong Kong, so everything's cheaper. And that's another reason why they go over the border for this uh, stuff, of course, is it's cheaper because of the lack of sales tax. So you can buy the milk powder here in China, you know, from an official outlet, but first of all, it's taxed, so it's a lot higher, number one. And number two, you don't know if it's real or not because there's a huge amount of counterfeit milk powder on the market here because you've got these unscrupulous piece of turd people that literally will counterfeit everything and anything that's popular. Beer, medicine, milk powder, shoes, socks, I don't care, anything. Like you get counterfeit everything in China and it's not really changing. It's still bad. You, everything is knocked off here. Okay. <laughs> So it's a different system, different tax, different border, all that kind of stuff. So most Chinese people have a restriction as to how many times, I'm saying mainland Chinese people, they can go into Hong Kong every year or every month. It depends. But there are certain circumstances, like if you have a Shenzhen Hukou, which basically means a residence, like a kind of a permanent residence in Shenzhen, then you can kind of uh, go over as much as you want. There's no real limit. You can go back and forth. And it's fairly easy. They've got these sort of e-channels, you just scan your fingerprint, go over and come back. You can do this multiple times a day. And of course, if you're a Hong Kong resident, you can do the same. You can, you know, come back and forth between um, mainland and uh, Hong Kong uh, it's pretty much as many times a day as you want. So what these kind of smuggling gangs do is they employ, you know, people that have these kind of situations. They go after the low-class Hong Kong people Lots of them who do this. So a lot of people blame mainland mainlanders for doing all this. Of course, they're the reason, they're the cause, but it's actually a lot of the time Hong Kongers, people with Hong Kong IDs are the ones actually taking this stuff over the border. Um, so they employ those Hong Kongers. They also employ people with hukos. And, you know, also, if a person can only go over once or twice a month or something, it doesn't matter. They'll employ those people too, and the, the, those one or two times pay them. So this is how it works. You'll get people go over. Usually they go to Shang Shui, which is the first stop on the, the sort of uh, train and it's not far. So it's kind of easy. You go over, you go to Shang Shui. Over there, you've already got the people that have been buying all the milk powder. It's, it's a, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's, it's a shit show over there. Um, they've got everything set up for smugglers. And what happens is you can go there with a big wheelie bag. They even have like these ranks of bicycle locks where you can go lock your 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 bag <laughs> while you go in and you know buy all of the milk powder and buy all of the pharmaceuticals and uh, cosmetics and stuff that you need uh, and you get people going in there with multiple big bags they fill them all up and then they either take it over themselves or they meet up with the runners who come over and take the bag and go over and then when they get to the other side, when they cross the border into Lohu, directly across the border, you will always see, you know, sort of random people sitting around with bags of milk powder. And these are kind of the collectors on the other side. And so people will come over and they'll, you know, give them their tin of milk powder or a couple of tins or whatever it is, you know, and then it gets kind of marked down and they'll get their kickback later. And then basically those people sitting there will just amass a huge amount of you know milk powder and then when they've got a certain amount then they'll uh, call their their guy to come and fetch it and the cycle just goes for the whole day and you can sit there if you want for the whole day and just watch the milk powder and the Ferrero Rocher chocolates <laughs> come in and uh, 
basically be collected and then sent off and then of course it gets sold on Taobao which is like the Chinese eBay or it gets sold through little import stores or whatever and it gets distributed across the country and they make a huge markup because like I said no sales tax tax in Hong Kong so even after you've paid your mule or your runner and uh, you know you've taken care of all the logistics you're still making a huge profit on this milk powder and of course because it's from Hong Kong you can tell that it's going to be real so let's move on to the chocolates this has baffled me for a very long time um, why these specific chocolates are so popular I've tried to ask a couple of people and basically all I can ascertain is that because it's gold is why people like it because it's wrapped in a gold wrapper and maybe because it's round you know the circle like yen uh, it, it has some significance in Chinese culture and that's why the mooncakes are round and all that kind of thing. It kind of means like togetherness and family and stuff. Although I don't, that's just my speculation. Pretty sure the gold thing does have something to do with it because Chinese people love gold. It's an auspicious color. Red and gold are basically the China's national colors on the flag and it's also their favorite colors and they use it in every sort of way possible whenever there's a festival so red and gold are very very popular um, and of course the Ferro Rocher chocolates are way cheaper in Hong Kong they're, they're stupidly cheap there compared to mainland China and of course in mainland China you get heaps of knockoffs uh, and they're awful I've had them I've had the knockoffs all the time because you, you you know they're all over the place and they taste terrible they're probably poisonous um, and you know they just look crap so getting real legit Ferro Rocher chocolates that are you know cheaper of course bonus and you can always buy these huge like packs of them in Hong Kong and uh, you know like I said for cheap so that's what's happening there and it's just it's like it's been a kind of a joke between me and my my friends that uh, Ferro Rocher and milk powder are sort of the most expensive commodities in China they're the most valuable I should say not expensive the most valuable commodities in China you know if you had a, a straight supply of milk powder and Ferro Rocher chocolates you'd be a billionaire you'd be a king <laughs> so I mean it's it's it seems silly but I mean here for instance take a look let's look in the smuggler dude's bag here you know he's one of the collectors what do we see we see Ferro Rocher chocolates um, and so yeah I that's really the the be all and the end all of this video guys I, I wanted to bring this very strange and interesting sort of phenomenon to your attention because here in China uh, you know these two commodities are smuggled like I said and trafficked probably more than any other substance and uh, if you're coming over to China and you want to make a quick buck just put a couple tins of milk powder in your bag and a few ferro rochers and you can probably sell it to those smugglers just over the border <laughs> anyway guys hope you enjoyed this one i'll see you in the next one and uh, as always you know the drill stay awesome